Hello, today is December 18th, 2008. We're meeting today with Mr. Don Norby at his home in Greeley, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Don, and uh, thanks for participating in the project today. It's a pleasure. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay. I was born in Wilmer, Minnesota, uh, October 13th, 1923. Um, my father and uh, mother were of Scandinavian descent. My grandparents came from Stavanger, Norway. And uh, we lived there um, until seven. When I was three and a half years old, my mother had to go to TB sanitarium. She had TB. Mm. And uh, after that, uh, she was out for a little while, but we couldn't survive. She couldn't take the winters, so we moved to Arizona. So I grew up in Arizona. From seven years on, through high school and part of the University of Arizona, then I went in the service. And uh, there were depression years, they weren't easy years. We lived uh, four years in Prescott and then the rest of the time in Tucson. Talk a little bit about the uh, your memories of the depression, particularly in this day and age when we're kind of going through uh, an economic downturn which probably is, pales in comparison. Can you, do you have any memories of the depression oh, and what yeah, it was like? Yeah. Well, we moved to Prescott my father had a little business in Minnesota, but he gave that up. We moved out there and he was just looking for work, any kind of work. He worked for a dollar a day uh, cutting timber and uh, we were just trying to survive. The first summer we lived in a tent in the mountain and then we were able to buy a little one-room house. I think we had paid $500 for it and uh, had dug well and no electricity and so forth. But I had good memories of those years because we did have enough food, we had a shelter, we heated and cooked with wood, we had some animals, that was great fun, we had some goats and uh, uh, chickens and uh, tried in different ways to meet our own needs. But uh, I learned there that uh, things don't make for happiness. We were happy as a family there. And it was on the outskirts of things, so it was next to the mountains, a great place for kids to play yeah. and grow up. Did, did the weather, uh, climate help your mom's uh, condition? Yeah, in Tucson it did, but she couldn't really seem to shake it. And finally she died in 1946, hmm. uh, about a year after I got out of the Navy. And uh, she's buried there in Tucson. So, uh, I was there, graduated from high school in 41, and then went to university for a while. The war came along, December 7, and things were kind of in flux because my mother developed not only tubercular lungs, but spine, oh. went into her spine. So she had to be put in a sanitarium, and we couldn't live together. My father had left us. He divorced her. And uh, so... Uh, I basically didn't have a home, my friends there, I lived with the friends for a little bit, finished out this year, the war was on, I decided I wanted to go to the Navy. Uh, they, I was in ROTC at the university and they wanted me to stay because they said, like an officer, but I wanted to go to the Navy, so I went in. Now why did you choose that uh, the Navy over the other branches? Well, maybe it was my Norwegian blood. Okay. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But I, uh, and I never regretted the choice. I enjoyed the Navy, and I love the sea, still do, far as I am from it. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. But um, anyway, I enlisted then. You couldn't be drafted the Navy at that time. You had to enlist. The Army was drafted, but not the Navy. Now, how much longer after this, after Pearl Harbor, did you enlist? And, and, it, and if we can back up, too, do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you first heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, we, I was uh, in Tucson, living with my mother, December 7th, and I, I remember it really shook us. It shook the whole nation, and uh, it mobilized the nation. We'd been very fragmented before. Uh, there was an isolation group, people that said, look, let them fight their war over in Europe, we're not going to get involved. We did that in World War One. we don't want to do it again. And so there was a um, a lot of division in the country, but when Pearl Harbor came, there was a tremendous 
unification and we realized we got to fight. And so the, uh, he had men lining up. They weren't waiting for the draft. They were lining up to enlist and go in. Long lines of men. Mm. And uh, the country mobilized very quickly. And anyway, uh, I finished that semester at uh, the university. And uh, I was in the ROTC. It was interesting. Their ROTC was the only cavalry unit left. Oh, is that right? They had horses and so forth. And they phased them out, of course, during the Second World War. No more cavalry, basically. They turned it into tank corps. And this. But I went in the service. I enlisted. I was sworn in in Phoenix, Arizona in August of 42. So it was a little over six months okay. after the war started. Mm -hmm. And I uh, went to boot camp in San Diego. And uh, they shortened the boot camp. I believe it used to be three or four months regular peacetime, but they shortened it. So I think we were only there five or six weeks. Now you had your ROTC experience, but uh, was it much of an adjustment going from a civilian to military life for you at all? Uh, yeah, it was. It, I can remember they when they bust us. We went by train from Phoenix to San Diego, where I went to boot camp. And they bussed us uh, from the train into the uh, naval s station there. And I remember as we were coming in, there were some of the <laughs> sailors around there. They started yelling, you'll be sorry, <laughs> you'll be sorry. <laughs> it was funny. They we knew we were all enlistees. We didn't have to come to there. <laughs> we maybe going to the Army. And so it was um, uh, put into a company, Company 506. I have a picture there of it. Um, and it was um, rigorous training, very different from the ROTC. Uh, we, did, we had close order drill and this sort of thing, but um, it was very different. And we didn't train with small arms there. Uh, and all sorts of different classes trying to prepare you and, and uh, teach you discipline. You learn to obey. I remember one time we failed on an inspection and the, um, the, the man, chief who was in charge of our company made us march out there in the San Diego sun until some of the men keeled over. He said, you're going to learn a lesson. <laughs> you're not going to goof up again. So it was, uh, that was interesting. You could apply for different schools, and I made pretty good grades. They tested you in different ways. And uh, it's interesting, a man told me, a friend told me when I was going in, he said, now, you're a Christian. He said, I think you'd be happier helping people than hurting them. He said, why don't you try to get in the hospital corps or something like that? So I thought, I'll try that. And so I applied for the hospital corps, but it was, that was full. And because I had good grades, they sent me to quartermaster school, which was kind of demanding too. And uh, they sent, shipped us by train from San Diego up to Rhode Island, where I went through oh, wow. quartermaster Third. school all across the country. Oh, yeah. And uh, on the troop train, it was a long, dirty trip. We finally got there, and we were formed into uh, different companies, classes. And they put us through this four-month quartermaster training school. Now, quartermaster in the Army is supply, but in the Navy it's navigation. You're working on the bridge, you're uh, involved in the navigation and the piloting and the steering of the ship mm. and this sort of thing, which I very much enjoyed. I was glad. And when I finished school, uh, while I was in school, my mother got very sick. The doctor sent a message, said, your mother's dying. He made her try to come home, and I tried to get a leave. This would have been the first part of December, I guess. And they said, it's wartime, no leaves are granted. So, oh, so I didn't get it. But it turned out we prayed for her, and she recovered and lived for a number of years longer. But the... Uh, the schooling then I, we finished, and then I did get a short leave, and then they sent me down to go aboard ship. 
and they went to Newport, Rhode Island, uh, Newport, Virginia, Newport News. And at first they put me on an old battleship, the old New York, BB-34. I was only on her a short time. I think they goofed in the paperwork because then they put me on a new cruiser that was just being uh, ready to be commissioned. And so uh, I was assigned to the cruiser and while I was waiting, they sent me to a gunnery school on the Wyoming, which was an old battleship there in Chesapeake Bay that they used for training. And they uh, trained me on a 40 millimeter. I'll show you a shell later, later but uh, I never was on the gun in, in action. I, I always went back into the quartermaster work. And so the ship was commissioned. Uh, I was part of the commissioning crew, which means you're a plank owner. They call it people who commission a ship a plank owner. You're one of the originals. And uh, it was a light cruiser, the Mobile CL-63, a little over 600 feet long, I think about 606 feet long. Beam was 66 feet about, and the sh ship's crew was about 1,250 men. Wow. And uh, it was a light cruiser in that we didn't have 8-inch, we had 6-inch guns for our main battery. 12 Six, four batteries, three each. That was your main, uh, your main battery. They spoke of it. Six inch. Then we had five inch, about twelve of those, and then we had forty millimeter, a number of those gun emplacements, and then twenty millimeter, much uh, smaller aircraft and aircraft. So we had a shakedown cruise, um, check us Chesapeake Bay, and then up the east coast, up to Boston, and then on up to uh, uh, Portland, Maine. We did gunnery practice up there, and this was all a training time too, a time when we were training, uh, taught your battle station, and uh, you, you were being really disciplined and trained to do your job and do it well. Can I interrupt here? How was it for, uh, here's a boy that uh, grew up in the desert of Arizona. How was it uh, going to sea? Did you get your sea legs? How was that? Oh yeah, I did. And I loved it. <laughs> any, any problems with seasickness or anything like uh... Well, I had a little at first, I think, but uh, nothing as bad as some. Some men are chronically seasick. I remember on one ship I was on, the man couldn't get over it. He was just throwing up constantly, and they put him, gave him short duty. He couldn't take it. No, I adjusted pretty well. And a cruiser is a big enough ship, so it's not as rough riding. I finished up the war on a destroyer, and they're rough. They're small, and and you really feel the sea. And in a heavy sea, the cruiser would feel it too. But. So we did the shakedown and came back to. Um, Newport, uh, and uh, then we we're going to the Pacific, and so they had a, a farewell service at the church that I was associated with there in, in Newport News, and five of us were going out in the Navy. Uh, four of us came back, one didn't. Mm. He, did. he was killed on an aircraft carrier. Willie Smith was his name, and uh, dear guy, but he he didn't make it through the war. Mm. And we, uh, when we set sail, we went down to the Caribbean, finally, and um, went to Panama, went through Panama. Interesting experience. Yeah, how was that going through the canal? Yeah, very exciting. I was on the wheel part of the time, and still remember the pilot. You'd take a pilot aboard because he knew the canal well. And he, he would tell him, I still remember him saying, steady, hold her steady, you know. You don't have a lot of clearance with yeah. some of that, so you have to be careful. But that was kind of exciting. Then we came out on the other side and worked our way up the coast to San Diego. And, and uh, then the time came when we uh, headed west, went to Pearl Harbor. I remember the first time coming in and seeing Diamond Head and seeing the, the island. And we weren't there too long, and then we had a uh, we were joined to a task force, 
and they began to use us. We were a new cruiser, and Admiral Limits came on board for a captain's inspection because he wanted to see his, some of his newest ships. And uh, I remember seeing him. He was a man uh, marked by real dignity. He was a man very much respected. And I can remember him talking to me. I think I was on the bridge at the inspection time. Wow. Huh. So it was an uh, interesting uh, experience. But anyway, he, he was our admiral. And uh, they began using us. And they really, the new ships that came in, they needed replacements. We lost a number. And so they uh, sent us on several raids first. We made a raid on Marcus Island. And uh, Wake Island. And then we dropped down to Tarawa and uh, preparation for the invasion later. And then we, they sent us on down. We crossed the equator and uh, was initiated, <laughs> <laughs> which was kind of interesting. Uh, they call you a polywog until you're initiated, and then you're a shellback. And so. Uh, and you survived that initiation? Because I, I hear they're pretty rough. Well, they shave your head. They, uh, they have what they call a royal baby. One of the fatter members of the crew who was a shellback and put grease all over his belly. And you had to come up and kiss his belly. <laughs> and then the final thing, as I remember, it was they had a target shoot. But they used to tow for target practice, a big canvas shoot like. You had to crawl through it. It was full of garbage. And uh, they were beating all the way through. <laughs> and then you got up the other side and washed off and you were initiated. <laughs> okay. I lost a ring going through that chute. I oh, was that? I find it. Huh. I had a navy ring. But anyway, uh, we went on uh, down then. We got stores, I think, that in the New Hebrides it was. And then we went on over toward the Solomon Islands. And that was our first. We made these three raids, and they were classed sort of as one big operation. They gave one battle star for the three raids. Now, now what would exactly be involved in a raid? What would... Uh... Well, we went in, uh, in some cases, we'd go in new shore bombardment, but we were always there as protection for the aircraft carriers. Oh, okay. I mean, and the planes would be going into bomb and uh, so forth. Um, and when we got down into the Solomons, we realized, well, we're in a danger area. I can remember seeing a destroyer there. We were in Tulagi, uh, anchored in Tulagi. Uh, it was kind of a naval outpost, you could say, there. And um, seeing destroyers with the bow blown off and the stern blown off, hmm. you realized you're in a dangerous area. And uh, we... Uh, got involved, we were involved in the taking of Bougainville, the island Bougainville. They'd already taken Guadalcanal and a couple other places, but Bougainville was a big island too that they wanted to take. And we were involved there and uh, it was mostly um, uh, aircraft protection and uh, fighting off the Japanese trying to come in and get the carriers. They mm -hmm. were after okay. the carriers. They were after us too, but, uh, and that was a kind of a hairy night. I remember one man told me later, he'd been in the combat information center on the ship, and he said that was the worst night of the war, he thought, as far as uh, under pressure the whole time. The Japanese were circling us, going around, and then one would peel off and go after us. And, and you, your battle station would be up on the bridge, or my battle station. Uh, or general we were quarters. were stationed around different places. Uh, they had to have quartermasters on the bridge, but they had to have a backup for, in case the bridge got blown away. Okay. Because the Japanese, of course, uh, would try to go for the bridge if they could, uh, knock it out. And underneath the bridge on the cruiser, there was an area called the Conning Tower which is heavily armored, and uh, I was assigned to it. Uh, I was the quartermaster in that area, along with officers and so forth. So if the bridge knocked away, we took over. Okay. That was the way it happened. Took over the 
what they call the con of the ship, where you were uh, basically operating the ship. So uh, uh, that was my battle station. And in training, they, um, I remember the, the captain too was pushing us to get there faster on your battle station so you would run. And they saw in the general quarters, and you'd be the clanging of the general quarters alarm. Everyone just was galvanized in action. You all started running for your battle station. And he wanted to get it down to five minutes. From the time it started, they made the announcement to the time you were ready on your battle station, your helmet on, ready to go. And so uh, we did that. We had a good crew and uh, disciplined men. Good crew. So we were involved in Bougainville. And they gave a battle star for that. And then the, uh, the next thing, we were assigned to a task force and moved up to Toronto. We were involved in the taking of Toronto, which was the first uh, kind of big defeat for the Marines, I think, in the war. And that was uh, when they went in. I had a friend who was uh, a coxswain on one of the landing craft. You mm. had to ferry the men in. But um, they ran into heavy problems. I remember being on the bridge and the captain was saying, it's not looking good. Mm. Because uh, they hadn't really discovered there was some quarrel there that slowed them from coming in. The, ships, uh, the landing craft couldn't get in as close as they would like, so the men had to get out and wade into the water, and then the Japanese just pulverized them. And uh, we were, they were surprised because we bombarded the place, we bombed it, but they were dug in so that when the men started coming up ashore, why they just blasted them. I think we lost a thousand Marines that first day. Oh, jeez. And then uh, a thousand or two more before it was over. But finally we got the island, finally took in an operation like that, how close would you guys come in to, to, uh, to shore? Well, we came in for shore bombardment, and I'm not sure just how close. And their batteries would be firing at us, and sometimes shells would land one side or the other. Mm. And that ship was, they called her the Lucky Mobile, because she went through the whole war without being hit by an enemy, which was unusual. Our sister ships were, get blasted and you have to come back to the States for repair and so forth. But she went through the whole war without losing, uh, being hit by the enemy. And after Tarawa, that was the uh, next battle star. Then the next one they moved us up into the Marshall Islands, which is north and we were kind of island hopping from one to the other. And uh, we were involved there in the Marshall Islands. And in one of those operations, um, one of our guns, during combat, one of our guns malfunctioned, it was five inch, and it fired right into a 40 millimeter on the ship. And so there were several men killed, about 20 men wounded. Mm. So those were our casualties. So because of the damage done and uh, Anyway, it was time to come back in for stores, and then we came back into Pearl Harbor. And I can remember uh, coming in, and uh, we were flying our flag at half mast because we had some dead aboard. And uh, the band was playing. And, uh, we felt proud you're an American. So after that, I had made. Uh, I kind of moved up. I started as an apprentice seaman, as low as you can go. <laughs> and then I made second class and first class seaman. And then I made third class petty officer. And when I did that, then uh, the, the ship has a complement. So many men in each rate that are supposed to be assigned. And it was over complement. So when I made rate, either one of the other men went or I went sent me back to the States for new construction. And I, uh, it would have been in December. And uh, before I went, 
I went to a, a naval R and R um, rest and recreation. They used the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, and uh, the Navy taken it over, and I was there for about a day or two. <laughs> it was kind of plush after uh, being at sea. And then they sent me back to the States, and I went back on the in Indianapolis with a sunk later in the war. And uh, I was a quartermaster, and they had me in charge of about six other men who were being transferred back. And we went into uh, uh, San Francisco, into Bremerton, I believe we ended up. But uh, I remember coming in through the Golden Gate, and it looked really good. Yeah, I got wow. back just in time for Christmas, but I picked up uh, what they call kind of jungle rot down in the South Pacific. It's just, uh, I don't know, what it was, some sort of fungus or something on the skin, so my skin was, you know, full of sores, really. And I remember I I was almost reluctant to go ashore. I, I thought, I look so bad, but hmm. I went ashore. I had friends in Oakland dear friends that whenever the ship would come in, we had a, uh, they had a room for me, a room that was set apart, and so I knew that I had a place to stay when I got into uh, Oakland. And I was given a leave, and then I, they transferred me to uh, Bremerton, uh, Washington, and uh, actually in the San Francisco era, area we would have been in Vallejo in that area. But uh, mm -hmm. they sat, transferred me then up to Bremerton and while I was there I made second class and then they uh, assigned me to a ship uh, that was being built. Uh, it was a CV a light carrier that they were producing very quickly and they were putting them on a uh, cargo ship hull basically so it wasn't a fast ship. It was designed to, to ferry planes over for replacement and designed especially for anti-submarine warfare also, where they would work with destroyer escorts. Was it a flat top or was it yeah, a uh, flat top? Okay. Yeah. And they put a, a flight deck on. You'll be able to see it here on okay. this one here model. Uh, a ship that, uh, anyway, I was assigned to it and uh, we commissioned it. In uh, that spring, uh, and went aboard in Astoria. So I was a plank owner of that ship too. It's a CVE 96, the Salamau was the name. S A L A M A U A. And I, I, I was on that ship for some time. Um, I was not too happy with the ship because I'd come off a first line ship. The cruiser was a first line ship, top speed of 32 to 34 knots, which is fast. And this was much slower. It wasn't designed really for uh, first line combat work. It was, top speed was about 18 or 19 knots. And it was so they designed it for backup work, basically. Now, toward the end of the war, they ended up using them on the front line, and they lost a bunch of them. Hmm. Because they were slow, and they weren't very heavily armored. And you... So anyway, I was on it for some time, um, and we took a hauled a load of aircraft to uh, Pearl Harbor, came back, then we took another load of planes down to Finshaven, New Guinea. And uh, it just, it's a long ways down there, and the ship was not that fast. I don't know if we cruised at about 15 knots or what we did, but I don't recall. But uh, And after that, uh, I was transferred. Uh, I wasn't too happy on the ship anyway, so I was kind of glad to go. I was hoping to get back on the cruiser, but they didn't put me on. During wartime, you didn't have much choice. Yeah. So I ended up, they put me on an older destroyer called the William B. Preston. And uh, 
Uh, it was what they call a flush deck destroyer, not one of the new ones. It had been built in the 20s. And, uh, but they saw a lot of service during the war. And we had sold about 50 of them to Britain at the, before we got into the war, because they were losing so many ships to submarines. And so they, but it wasn't a, um, a new ship. And uh, so it was being used when I was on it for escort work uh, and a lot of training of pilots. We worked a lot with so many smaller carriers. They were training uh, naval pilots. Uh, you know, take off and landing, take off and landing, and in the process, you were, you'd always lose a few. They'd go and they'd drink, and uh, our job was to be anti-submarine screening for the ship, and also to pick up any that went in. Okay. And so we would have to hurry over and try to rescue the man that went in. <laughs> I was on that ship, made first class. And then the war finally came to an end, and uh, um, the captain wanted me to stay on. He said, I'll make a chief if you'll go around. And we're going to take the ship around the East Coast. And I decided I wanted to get out and, and finish my college, get on with life. Mm -hmm. So I got out of the service in October 45. Okay. And I went back to college, graduated, during, while there met my wife. Did you go back to and finish at uh, Arizona? No, I, I, uh, there was a school on the West Coast in Santa Barbara that had just moved there. It was opening late. It was a smaller college, good college, and uh, I was accepted there. And so I got to go into college late because they were starting late, and I was out in October. Yeah. And I went back to college, and my wife married, graduated. We moved back to Illinois. I did graduate work in Wheaton and uh, got an MA. And then uh, we uh, had our first child born there, a daughter. And uh, then I, since that time, I've been involved in Bible teaching, basically. And I taught for several years uh, with uh, the uh, a Bible school in Toronto and then a couple years in Chicago. And then uh, we moved to Oklahoma after leaving Chicago, lived there 12 years, involved in Bible teaching and church planning and so forth. And then we moved to California, where we, my wife had come from, she's a Californian. Lived there six years, doing more of the same work, taught some in the Bible school there. And then moved to Greeley in 1970, and. We got moved and got very involved in college work, university work, working with students. Still in, in religion oriented yeah, uh, studies? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah we had okay. Bible studies with them and this sort of thing. And then I um, uh, also got a lot involved with uh, international students. I had a group on campus called Friends of International Students, a community group that worked with students. And we were involved in that. I was a president of it a number of years and so forth. And uh, we had a very happy time with foreign students. Worked a lot with some from uh, Saudi Arabia, some of our first students, uh, uh, some from Germany, and then a lot from Taiwan. Uh, we just had a lot of contact with students from Taiwan. Hmm. We hear from them every Christmas, and uh, they invited us over a couple times, paid our way. Over, over Is there. that right? Yeah. Treated us royally, put us up at the at the Grand Hotel in Taipei and so forth. <laughs> so yeah, so we've been involved with that, and then working with the local group here, and then Bible camp work. Gotten back to several ships reunions, a number. Um, last year may have been the last one, and I didn't get to it for the cruiser because uh, they're all dying off. Sure, yeah. The last one where I was, there were only 15 of us there out of a crew of 1,250. So um, most of them are gone. 
But I have some, one of the men who would come to the reunions would always make some little memento. And I have some of those there that are uh, reminders of life aboard ship. So that's kind of the story and uh, of the ships. The cruiser was my favorite ship. Yeah, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll back up. I'd like to ask you some questions about that. What was life like on a ship as far as uh, living conditions, uh, sleeping conditions, the food? Uh, it sounds like, you know, particularly when you're on, the, on that slower ship, large amounts of time getting from one place to the other. What did you do for in your off time? You can you talk well, a little bit about that altogether? Okay, okay. Uh, I would, as a quartermaster, we would stand watches. Uh, You'd be on four and you'd be off two. Uh, you'd be off two watches, four hours on, eight hours off, this kind of thing, usually. But it would be interrupted, like uh, if you were in a battle zone, uh, they'd have early morning general quarters, usually about an hour before sunrise. You'd hear the general quarters alarm and you'd have to man your battle station. And they'd stay there for an hour or so, because this was a critical time. This was a time they often attacked. Mm, okay. So, uh, you, one of the things, especially uh, aboard the cruiser, was loss of sleep. You just uh, never seemed to get enough sleep. If you got off the mid-watch, you'd get off at a uh, quarter of four, maybe. And then they'd wake you up about five. <laughs> And then during the daylight hours, you had work to do, cleaning, maintaining. Sometimes you'd be painting the ship. Or there's always work to be done. So uh, it was a busy life. Quarters were tight. Um, and a lot of men on the, these ships, um, a fighting ship like that, a lot of the men are needed simply to operate the guns during battle. You don't need that many men to run the ship. And so uh, the department I was in, the navigation department, you needed those men whether you're in battle or not. But um, so you had a lot of men uh, to man those guns. You had to have men to pass ammunition and all the rest. And so you had a lot of men living in tight quarters. The bunks would be close, they were about three high, and uh, you had about room bare, barely to turn over. Uh, so there, it wasn't luxury accommodations. But, uh, and the thing uh, about the older ships, now the new ships now have air conditioning, but the older ships, we didn't have any air conditioning. And we were in the tropics, it would be terribly hot below decks. They had forced air. They would, blow through, but it was just hot air. And uh, so a lot of the men would at times give up trying to sleep below decks and they just go up and sleep on top side of hmm. the deck and try to get a little sleep through the night. Yeah. Uh, the food, well, it was simple, it was wholesome. Uh, you had a mess hall uh, on the bigger ships, especially, and uh, uh, it wasn't gourmet food, <laughs> but it was, yeah, I didn't lose weight, uh, well, a little during combat, but most of the time the food was okay. Uh, lots of just spam, which I didn't particularly want to eat anymore after I got out. <laughs> but. It was better than uh, sleeping in a foxhole. Yeah. You know, you know, if you were in battle, you might have to you'd stay at your battle station day and night and try to, try to keep going. And they would bring sandwiches around to you uh, for food. That was all you got when you were at your battle station. Can you talk about a little bit about what it's like to, to, to be in battle? I mean, for someone like myself that has no idea what it's like to be in a dangerous situation like that, uh, how did you, how did you deal with the stress and and we, I mean, were you scared? I mean, can you d describe to 
Okay, well, uh, remember the first time we went into action when we made that raid on Marcus Island. And we were, we had been about 900 miles from Japan, and so we were uh, pretty close. And the main reason for hitting that was we weren't intending to take it. We just wanted the Japanese to realize we could get to them. And so uh, I remember as we were getting ready to go into combat, seeing the chief quartermaster he had a cup of coffee. We always had coffee on the bridge to help keep awake. And uh, I can remember him holding a cup and his hand was shaking like this. And I realized that man's afraid. And he had been on a ship that had sunk down at the, near Guadalcanal. He was on the Chicago, I think. And uh, I realized he was afraid. And when you go into battle, there is a, 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 adrenaline is flowing, and uh, you're knowing some stress, but I was a Christian, and I, I can really say I, I didn't have the fear a lot of men had. So your faith held you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And now, there was stress. The captain we had, Captain Wheeler on the cruiser, had gone down, been on one ship that went down, and he was showing the signs of stress. And after I left, and the friend quartermaster told me that uh, they, he was transferred later because in battle he would lose bowel control. He'd have to have extra pants up there to be changed. Ship's doctor would always dare him, uh, afraid you know, to have some problems. So that uh, uh, it uh, told especially on some more than others, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you have faith, uh, and I did, I came to know the Lord when I was in high school, and uh, it was something that uh, I, I really didn't have a terror, that some bad experience, I guess you could say. Okay. There's always a sense of fear, and the sense that you're alert and you're under pressure, but uh, it depends a lot on your, your own mental attitude in yeah. some of these sure. situations. Sure, yeah. What was it, uh, what was it like, uh, I mean, many in, in your generation, I mean, obviously you'd moved from Minnesota down to Arizona and, and seen a little bit, but, but basically you grew up right around, uh, you didn't travel far from where you grew up. Now here you are crisscrossing across the country and down through all these exotic locations. What was that like uh, from your perspective, seeing well, it was kind of exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it was exciting. Yeah, I like you say, I've never been on the East Coast. Uh, yeah. It was quite different. And made some dear friends there uh, in Newport News that I kept in touch with until they died. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it was exciting. And I liked the sea. I enjoyed the sea. I enjoyed the, the travel. I enjoyed my work uh, as a quartermaster. The quartermaster kept the ships long, which meant he entered uh, any change of course, he entered the weather, uh, the barometer reading, and all these things. And also, of course, he uh, uh, would assist the navigator in taking sights, and uh, on a smaller ship, he would do a lot of it himself. He would function as a navigator. And uh, so it, it was... Uh, enjoyable work. He kept up the charts. I'll show you a chart here later. But uh, charts have to be updated. There'd be changes in navigational aids, and so you'd have to update them. And the quartermaster had charge of all the charts and keeping them updated. So, mm -hmm. so it was an uh, interesting work. Yeah, I bet so. How, how about communications as far as uh, communicating with, communicating with uh, say, your mother or friends or something? How was that? Was that uh, reliable, or particularly since you guys are all over the place. It was getting... very fast. Uh, I remember my dad sent me uh, some smoked fish. <laughs> he knew I liked to eat fish. He sent me some smoked fish, and then he caught me down in New Hebrides or someplace down there. But it was moldy. <laughs> it hadn't survived. So that... Uh, 
Mail wasn't fast. It would finally come in, maybe be three or four weeks before you'd get it or whatever. Now with air travel, of course, and all. And or email, yeah. you know, nowadays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. guys have. Instantaneously. Uh, yeah, guys yeah. have laptops all over. And, yeah, because yeah. I correspond with a guy in the Navy uh, during the Gulf War, and that, he had a laptop, and, you know, and email. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Quite different. What about uh, general news, just about how the war was going on, or hearing such things as VE Day or Roosevelt's death? I mean, was that were you guys getting that sort of information as well, or well, uh, not, or just general not, news from the states? I guess not too well sometimes. Sometimes, if we'd come into Pearl Harbor, you'd get a newspaper to find out what's happening in the war, because I think the civilian public was a little more informed than we were at times. Hmm. Well, we went to sea, uh, you, you had sealed orders. Uh, we didn't know where we were going. And uh, so you get out to sea a half a day or a day, and then they open your orders, and you find out where you're going, what's going to happen. And uh, as a quartermaster, I'd be one of the first to find out, so there were men who were always asking me. They, they called you wheels. Is the ship's wheel that's on your insignia. And they'd say, wheels, where are we going? <laughs> they, they were interested, but because we were on the bridge, we'd find out first. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you didn't know when you left port just where you were heading many times. Did that uncertainty bother you at all? or would uh, No, it's just yeah. kind of exciting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I might read a, a poem that I, uh, I wrote. It, Oh, please, yes. Uh, about uh, Tarawa, if I can find it here. Uh, the, uh, because I, it was uh, a very uh, striking time. Uh, I, I saw more death there than I ever saw uh, other times because Usually, uh, we were firing at a distance. We shot down a plane. Never saw the guy. Yeah. He went in a drink. Um, shore bombardment. You didn't see the carnage that right. was left behind. Right. But at Toronto, we saw these bodies all around, and uh, 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 let me see if I can read this. Gray ships rolled gently, decks filled with spent shell casings, as ships, yeah, I get a light. Let's read this, Let's see if I can get up here and read it. Angry gun silent, standing my watch I scan the sea. Loaded, distended bags of human flesh, bursting taut skin, bob on the heaving bosom of an anguished sea, decaying hopes. Brave young men hit that beach, facing a storm of steel and fire that blasted them into the sea. Budding dreams, a business, a wife's caress, the friendship of children, a life lived full, rock, fueled by tropic sun, I weep and cling to my God. Wow. It was, um, that was my most intimate contact with, you know, a lot of dead bodies. Because the sea was full. They were bombing all around us. And I remember the president, captain saying, uh, be careful you don't run over. He said, there are boys. Oh, boy. 
you know, were these floating out from the islands or from ships that had sunk, or where were these? No, they're mostly marines that had been, uh, they'd been shot down before they could get to the beach. And the, the marines tried to bring their men out, but they couldn't get these. So you know, they were just, um, that's a, a lasting memory. There were floating bodies all mm. around us, and we were, uh, and this was at the conclusion that I think it took us three or four days to take the island. And afterwards, we were just kind of patrolling up and down, uh, just offshore, and uh, surrounded by these bodies. And, mm. uh, young men that uh, died. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so. Um, That's kind of my story. Yeah. Now you said uh, with your your work with the Bible studies that uh, you had traveled back to and been invited and traveled to Taiwan uh, during that time. Had you ever had a chance to go to any of the places that you were stationed at or had been to uh, during the war? You mean uh, overseas? Yeah. Uh, only Pearl Harbor. I've never been back to the Solomon Islands. I haven't been to, back to the Gilbert Islands. That's where Toronto was, or the Marshall Islands. I've gone across the sea. I've been in Taiwan a number of times, uh -huh. Korea, and doing Bible teaching, and down in Singapore. But uh, I haven't uh, revisited those places. Some of them are not really tourist right, resorts. Yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so I know I haven't been back to some of those areas. I have kind of interesting memories though when we were in Tulagi there in the Solomons um, uh, during that Bougainville campaign. The natives would come out in their canoes wanting to uh, sell trinkets or something and uh, maybe get something in return. Okay, some of them were interested in cigarettes or whatever. <laughs> and so. Um, that's a memory of that. Wow. Um, you said that you had uh, been to a, a number of reunions. Did you keep in touch with any buddies throughout the years uh, at all? Well, some. There's one quartermaster that I, I, is still living, and I keep in touch with him. We've been friends now for, you know, 65 years. Better. Hmm. And uh, he lives on the East Coast. He wa stayed in the military, stayed in the Navy, and uh, was a 30-year man, and uh, was a quartermaster. Um, so he's the only one, basically, that I've had lasting contact. Most of the others, occasionally I've had contact, they're all dead now, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but I still have touch with him. I was thinking of calling him again. His name's Ed Buckaloo. Lives in Chesapeake, over there in Virginia. So. How do you think uh, those war years, your, your military years, played into your life, affected your life, uh, changed your life at all, or did it, or was it just just a, a period of your life? How do, you, how how would how would you explain those years? Uh, did, yeah. Well, uh, how do you explain? I mean, obviously, that, with, with that poem, I think would have a yeah. That experience to me would just be amazing, but uh, a lasting effect. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think the it made men grow up. I mean, uh, you maybe went in there uh, sort of with an adolescent mentality, but you came out and you're a man. If you face death, if you face danger, if you, and your discipline has been good, you learn to obey, um, and uh, I think you came to have a, a love for your country in a sense. If you fought for something, it's uh, valuable to you, mm -hmm. it's worth something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why it hurts veterans if they see uh, flag being defiled or things like that. Aboard ship, 
the uh, colors, as we speak of them, they were in our charge, the quartermasters. We had, we ran up the flag and uh, so forth. And uh, so uh, um, it changed your perspective. I think most of the men, when they got out, they wanted to get on with life. They were serious. Uh, the atmosphere at college, I know when I went back, most of them servicemen. They were there. They're not going to mess around. They wanted to get through school. Um, they wanted to live life and do it right. So that... Um, uh, did, did you find yourself that way as well? Because I mean, you you had experience both ways. You had the pre-war uh, year of college and and post-war. Did you find yourself a more serious student once you? Well, I suppose I was I was more serious than some today, anyway, uh, because of uh, uh, going through the depression years, and then my father left us and divorced uh, my mother. He left us in 1939, and so uh, I became the man of the house, okay. and since yeah. I grew up faster okay. than some. So, uh, yeah. yeah, but I I think uh, military service used to be good for men. Now, some men now, if they get in, at least like the Vietnam War, they got into drugs one thing or another, and that kind of messed them up. But there wasn't any of that when I was in, and um, pretty rigid discipline, and, and uh, I enjoyed that. I, I didn't resent it. I appreciated authority, and and it moved up and was in a certain position of authority myself, in charge of the navigation of the destroyer. So, yeah, a lot of good. Good memories in connection with the, some of the memories that aren't so good. Yeah, yeah. Well, is there anything that we'll, we'll start to wind down this interview? Is there anything that I didn't ask you, or anything you, you can think of that you wanted to talk about? Any stories that now thinking back after this hour of talking that oh, I forgot to talk about this. Is there anything uh, we left out that you wanted to talk about? Uh, anything actually? No, I mean, open. I don't. I don't uh, not sure. Um, they did, you know, the ship, the mobile was uh, scrapped in, I think, 1947. So it was just a couple of years after the war they scrapped it. Kind of a shame, beautiful ship. But they had too many ships. Yeah. Right. Our Navy was the biggest Navy in the world's ever seen. I've been in a task force where as far as you could see, the horizon, the ships, everything. Oh, that must have been a spectacular sight. Yeah. Amazing sight. Yeah. Huh? And... Uh, uh, so they were scrapping ships right and left, but uh, and we would have the ships reunions. They started doing that some years after the war, and then they uh, built another ship some years later, a guided missile cruiser, and that's the hat I'm wearing here, the Mobile Bay, and they invited the old Mobile crew to come and uh, be at their commissioning. So that was kind of exciting. And then a little later we had a ship's reunion and they invited, it was in Jacksonville, Florida, and they invited us to come aboard the ship and they went out to sea for about 50 miles, had gunnery practice, came back. And that was kind of exciting. Uh, they don't do that usually for people, but uh, this was honoring the old Mobile crew. Uh. And so that, that was an exciting time. Yeah. They sent me a piece of the old decking from the Mobile. I'll show you that. Okay. It's um, it was a plank over. So they sent it. This is some of the old, old teak, teak decking huh. on the ship, heavy and thick. And uh, when they scrapped the ship, they saved it. And they, uh, uh, because I was a plank over, I got a piece of it. <laughs> this is a piece of the Mobile. I'll be darned. That, uh, I one day walked on that deck, <laughs> ah. so it was kind of interesting. And then we, there are a number of these uh, things here, the mementos he, he made, uh, this fellow who would come to the reunion. And uh, uh, this is, of course, one of the life rafts that he made a replica of. And uh, he just made a number of different things that way. There's one that shows a ship's ladder and lockers 
for the men to be there. And uh, so he would make those things as kind of his hobby. And when we'd get together, then he would give each one of us a memento of that reunion. <laughs> ah. So that was kind of nice. And this is a, uh, a marvel of, the, of two of the ships. Uh, this is the cruiser here. I wonder if I should take this off. No. Uh, it would have uh, two forward main battery, six inch and two aft. And uh, on the fan tail, it had a crane, and we carried two uh, uh, airplane, seaplane type, that we used for spotting. Okay. They would uh, in combat. Uh, they'd be airborne, we'd catapult them off, and they'd be up there circling around and uh, uh, spotting to direct the fire, the shore bombardment, this kind of thing. And what, then they would land right next to the plane and you'd pluck them out of the water with your crane? Is yeah, that, they, yeah, that was quite an interesting operation. They have to land and you had to coordinate things pretty well. And they would have a, like a cargo net that uh, he'd kind of uh, fly up on, cut his engine, and then the cargo net would hold the, it was like a hook underneath. And uh, then the, the crane would reach out and pick the plane up and bring it in and set it on the huh. catapult. We had two of those, and uh, that was customary on cruisers. Uh, and this other one is the uh, small aircraft carrier. It was about 550 feet long, a little shorter than the cruiser. Can you swing it around to, so it's that, okay, there we go. So it's on this side here. We yeah. Are. Okay. And uh, this is a model of it. You can see it was built on a cargo hull, a Kaiser hull. It was built up in Oregon. And uh, they put the flight deck on it. And uh, you had the bridge and that here to the, on the right side. So that uh, that was the they call them jeep carriers, a small carrier. At the end of the war, uh, the one I was on the Salamaua, I'd been transferred off of, but uh, she was hit with a kamikaze, and they lost about 20 men and I think uh, maybe 50 wounded. Mm. Uh, one of those suicide bombers came right yeah. in on the flight deck. Oh boy! And uh, crashed and killed a number. So they. They used some of them there at the end of the war, and some of that operation, the kamikaze planes were coming in, and they just pushed them in there into a situations they were not really designed for. Because they didn't have the speed, their top speed was about 19 knots, and whereas a cruiser or a destroyer, they're 32, 34 knots, something like that. And they're more, more maneuverable, yeah. and with more firepower. So these, these were kind of sitting ducks. And they, they didn't have much protection, so they lost a number of them. It went down. Hmm. And this well, is, we'll uh, what we'll do is we'll wind down the interview, and then we'll we'll, we'll videotape all your pictures. Uh, from the interview part of it, is there any statement that you would like to make uh, about anything, really, to kind of just close out this uh, this interview? To a statement to anybody that'll watch us in the future that you would like to close out this interview with? Well. Um, I, I'm glad for my time in the military. I don't regret it. And I, I'm glad for the war I was in. It was a just war. No one there was objecting and saying we shouldn't have done this or anything like that. And I feel sorry for the servicemen in some of the wars since, where there have been all these uh, uh, questions raised. And uh, when men are going into battle and they're facing death, they've got to feel it's a just cause, it's a noble cause, it's worth fighting for. And you can't tell them, hey, we made a mistake and you shouldn't be doing it. And that's why this thing in Iraq, uh, you know, is you can't expect the president to stand up there and say, hey, boys, it's all a mistake. We shouldn't have done this. You, they've got to realize when you're in that situation, what we're doing is worthwhile. It's worth risking your life for. Yeah. And that was true of the Second World War. So I'm glad I was in that war and not yeah. want some other war. Sure. And, uh, and I'm glad, too, that through all of this, I had faith. Because I saw men who, under battle, would be very afraid and 
maybe praying and saying, well, I'm going to change my life when I get out of this, and uh, I'm going to clean up my act, and, uh, you know, making vows and so forth because they were afraid. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a wonderful thing if you know the Lord and you have peace with God. Wonderful. And I did that. <laughs> Okay. Well, Don, I want to thank you for uh, sitting down to, to tell your story today. Uh, more importantly, though, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you. Okay, Don. Uh, that's what they call a flat hat. It was a dress hat that you uh, used in when you were in cooler climates because it's too warm otherwise. And this was a picture taken of me uh, while I was in quartermaster school. It would have been about uh, December of 19... 42. So you're what, about 19 then? Yeah, yep. about 19. This is a picture. That's a white hat that I'm wearing here. This is what was used, especially in warmer areas, and uh, is very common. I don't even know if they use that older flat hat anymore in the Navy. Oh, is that right? Yeah. But uh, this would have been taken sometime later, maybe a year or two later, uh, I think while I was in the service. There's my dog tag that you wore as identification in case you were hurt or killed, you always had this identification on you. This is my insignia at the as a first class quartermaster. You can see the wheel, the ship's wheel, that marks the quartermaster. He was involved in steering and navigation. And um, up here are a couple of the ribbons. This has a, is American area combat. This is Asiatic Pacific with four battle stars on it. Good conduct. There's another one that could have been on there that was for a combat veteran uh, insignia. There's the uh, three stripes, that marks the first class. One stripe is third class, two stripes second, and then the uh, first class. And then you go to chief where they change the uniform completely. You don't wear the white hat and the uh, uniform you used to wear. Uh, that's a 40 millimeter shell. That's the gun I trained on on the Wyoming. And uh, it was an aircraft, very effective an aircraft, and I believe still uh, used today. But you never put those skills uh, to work I, I, at in the no. battle? Okay. I, I was put in that because I had a little spare time, and I think they figured, well, it wouldn't hurt him to have some training Cranton, in that area training. too, in case yep. it has to be a backup or something. But I never uh, was on a gun in, in combat. Uh, that wasn't my area of uh, training. This was our smallest anti-aircraft gun. It was a 20 millimeter. And they still use this today, that guided missile cruiser I went on, uh, the new one, uh, they're the newest we have. They have one of these tw uh, 20 millimeter. It's a very rapid fire. It just lays up a sheet of steel if a plane gets in that close. What are the, the sights and sounds like when in the heat of battle with these all these guns going off and pretty noisy <laughs> smell of gunpowder and I mean it just uh... what used to be uh, kind of scary was when a battleship was firing over us and those uh, sixteen inch shells would come over you and, then whoosh, <laughs> and it, the ship would shake it's, wow uh, huh. yeah because those projectiles I think weighed about a ton jeez a tremendous I think, uh, this is a ship's barometer. I used this all the time when I was on the bridge. You had to make regular readings and uh, put down the reading in the ship's log. And this was a barometer that was effective on a destroyer and the captain let me have it. And uh, I got, took it home and got it fixed and it's still functioning I'll be done. all these years before. This is a picture taken of us in 1957. You can see we're all a little bit younger then. And then I'll show a picture of my wife and myself, some taken some years ago, not too long. Okay, this is a ship's chart. I, quartermasters had charge of the charts. We had a chart house where we kept the charts. This is a, a large scale of the whole Pacific, and most of our charts were very detailed and in small areas. But that gives you an idea of uh, the ship's chart, which we had charge them and had to keep updated and... Well, and a pretty amazing so position as far as all the different areas that you were involved in and, and responsible for. Yeah, you well, know? it was enjoyable work, challenging work, so yeah. it was exciting. Yeah, that's the ship chart of the Pacific.